Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Paula Feldman, Director of Business Intelligence with PMMI, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. Today we're going to hear from David Billy and Andrew Jureski, and I know I just said that wrong, Andrew, I apologize, research wow. consultants with DeNovo. David and Andrew will be covering the findings of PMMI's 2018 Snack Foods Packaging and Processing Market Assessment Report. David Billy has more than 10 years of experience in the consulting industry. He joined DeNovo in 2014 and has been successfully managing consulting projects at DeNovo such as marketing analysis and assessments, voice of customers, and leads generations for more than four years in various end markets. To include packaging, consumer industry, plastics, compounders, polymers, pulp and paper coating and adhesives, oil and gas, pharmaceutical, and I'm sure many, many more. Andrew joined the DeNoble team in 2017, and he has experience in manufacturing, consulting, and new business development. He's worked on several projects on global industry involving the analysis of the potential of different materials in a variety of end markets. His packaging equipment experience started at Procter & Gamble as a manufacturing engineer in their family care business unit. Today, David and Andrew will interpret the information included in the Snack Food Packaging and Processing Market Assessment providing insights and detailed information, including consumer trends, e-commerce trends, and industry forecasts by snack types. So just a few points before we start the webinar. If you have any questions at all during the webinar that you'd like to ask of David or Andrew, in the bottom left-hand corner of your screen, you'll see a participant feedback box. Please type them in there, and we'll ask them at the end of the webinar. Their presentation is, has chock full of information, so it'll last anywhere between 30 to 45 minutes, and they will answer your questions at the end. So at this point, I'd like to welcome David and Andrew from DeNovo and turn the webinar over to David. Thank you, Paula. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon to you all. Uh, thank you all for attending this, uh, this webinar. So my name is David. And I'm Andrew. So as uh, Paula introduced us already, uh, we both work for the company DynoVo which is uh, specialized in B2B marketing consulting. Uh, our office here in the U.S. is located in, uh, uh, in the Philadelphia suburbs. That's where we are right now. And we also have two other offices in Germany and, and in China. So we recently finished that investigation for PMMI on the North American snack food market. And the following, is a presentation. I mean, the following presentation is an overview of our findings. The full findings can be found in the report that uh, PMMI already uh, published. So after a brief introduction describing the scope, the goals of the study, uh, the market segmentation, uh, we'll give you some uh, numbers, market data about the snack food market nowadays. Uh, then we'll look deeper into what are the main snack food market trends, We'll talk about the trends and challenges that are faced by the CPGs uh, in the industry. And then we'll have a look of their unmet needs uh, before we reach the conclusion of this presentation. So uh, the goal of this study was to actually refresh a 2012 study made on the snack food, uh, snack food market uh, to provide uh, PMMI members with insight of the market trends, the CPG challenges, the unmet needs, and really the idea was to understand what are the implications in machinery investment in the next two to three years. Uh, so we target the snack food, both the sweet and savory segments, and we were uh, focused on North America, especially on, on the USA, which uh, dominates the North American uh, snack food market. So snack food can be defined as a small amount of food uh, that is usually used for light meals or for eating between meals. It's more and more being seen as a meal replacement, actually. Um, snack food is something that can be eaten in a hurry or in a casual manner, and that does not require any preparation. Uh, snack food does not need to be heated in the microwave or does not need to be thawed, for example. So on this slide, uh, what we show you here is the methodology that we use during the three months of our investigation. So we combine uh, secondary research with mainly primary research. So we interviewed key players along the snack food uh, value chain. Uh, 
which is described in the uh, right, uh, the upper right hand side corner. Uh, you see the main players we've interviewed, uh, which are co-packers, brand owners, retailers. Uh, we did also talk to a few uh, OEMs, uh, which were contacted by PMMI and who were willing to, uh, to share their insight with us here. Uh, the pie chart at the bottom uh, shows you, show you a breakdown of the type of player we talk to during our investigation. Uh, so to the surprise, you see co-packers, some retailers, and mostly brand owners. Uh, the reason why the, the slice by brand owner, the brand owner category is uh, so large is that it actually includes a number of co-packers for whom um, the, their brands, their own brands, actually make most of their business. So we place them in, in the brand owner section. The next two slides uh, describe here the, uh, the sweet and the savory snack segments and sub-segments that were part of uh, this investigation. So on the sweet side, we have five main sub-segments that were confectionery items, uh, bars, snack cakes and donuts, cookies and biscuits, and fruit snacks. Um, just as a note, I would add that for the purpose of this study, we actually uh, put aside all dairy and frozen products. So as I said, frozen products were out of scope because they need some preparation. And dairy products, mostly yogurts, uh, are not necessarily designed to be uh, eaten as a snack in between meals, but more as part of a larger meal. So we omitted those uh, in the sweet snack category. Next, on the savory snacks, uh, we actually have a higher number of, uh, of sub-segments. Uh, we have the traditional salted snacks, popcorn and rice snacks, crackers and biscuits, processed snacks, uh, but we've also added four uh, more recent categories of snacks, which are, as you'll see later, uh, growing fast. Uh, those are the meat snacks, the nuts and seeds, the cheese snacks, and the fresh snacks. Uh, of all those four categories, uh, you'll see the combination snacks, which usually include a combination of all different types of, uh, of food elements. Uh, those kind of blur the lines here. So we haven't put a, a sub-segment dedicated to combination snack because they actually encompass different type of food. Um, but they are, they are counted there uh, either in meat snacks, if they are mostly made of meats or, or cheese. In the cheese combo category, if they were uh, mostly made of cheese. So I will now let Andrew uh, give you some details on the, the current state of the, the snack food market. Okay, thank you, David. <coughs> um, so, j yeah, just very quickly, if anyone's not hearing us very well, please flag it to Paula, and Paula can let us know. Uh, okay, so I first want to start here with just a little bit about the, the snack food market, both globally and in North America. And then after that, we'll delve into certain snack food market trends and start talking about the impact on packaging. Um, okay, so uh, on slide eight right here, um, uh, let's talk a little bit about um, kind of a global uh, snack food market, see where North America fits in that, and just some market specifics in general. So if you look at the top two, uh, the charts at the top of the slide, you have a chart that kind of depicts market shares by region some North America segment information, sweet and savory, and then we've got growth rates in the top right corner, regional growth rates. So I think the key learning here is that while Europe and North America are the two largest um, regional markets in terms of share and revenue, they're also the slowest growing markets, um, which you know, kind of makes sense as well. They're developed regions in general. Um, the developing markets of you know, the Asia-Pacific region, um, Latin America and Middle East and Africa are really experiencing the greatest growth. Um, in North America, just a quick aside here, the sweet segment is, um, is worth about 60% of the market, and then the savory se uh, segment um, controls about 40% of the market um, as it is today. Um, some regional specifics uh, in North America and Middle East, you've got meat snacks that are growing relatively quickly. So meat snacks will also include some of those combination snacks that David was talking about right now, um, where you have your meat and maybe a healthy component, that kind of thing. Um, in Asia Pacific, you've got refrigerated snacks like cheese snacks, you know, and cheese combination snacks that are growing relatively quickly. In Latin America, you've got sort of crackers and rice, uh, rice cakes that have experienced significant growth. 
In Europe, you've got um, dips and spreads, other types of combination snacks that have grown uh, relatively quickly. Finally, globally, nuts and seeds, exploiting the, the better for you trend, um, are, uh, really, uh, are the fastest growing subsegment. Also, they're very fast growing in North America, and we'll get into that uh, in just a little bit. Okay, so on this next slide right here, um, let's uh, delve a little bit more into the savory side of things. So, um, the, global, the global savory snack market was worth about $100 billion in 2016, growing at a rate of about 9% over the next two years, so just under 10% growth rate, so it's relatively decent growth. Um, North America represents the largest market regionally, so just under 40%. However, it is growing at a lower rate than the global growth rate. So it's just under half of the global growth rate uh, is what North America is experiencing. So as we mentioned, meat snacks, uh, combination snacks really are uh, growing uh, very fast in North America. Globally, you've got nuts and seeds that are the fastest growing subsegment that are also really playing a, a big role in North America and Europe as well. So, okay, so um, on this slide, let's talk a little bit about the sweet snack uh, segment. Um, so in, in the 2016-17 time frame, uh, it was worth about 55 to $60 billion annually. Um, if you look at the table, we have some market specifics there that are associated with specific subsegments um, so, uh, in the sweet segment. So again, the key learning here is that um, you have snack cakes and confections that are your two largest subsegments on the sweet side, but they're only growing at about an average growth rate, whereas your snack bars and your fruit snacks, which are the lowest in terms of sort of market share and size, are experiencing the greatest growth, really exploiting the better for you and single serve trends. Um, in terms of cookies, uh, right now uh, they've experienced a certain, they've stalled, cookie growth is kind of stalled right now, but um, we, we, we don't really believe this is the most long term trend just because, I mean, people are still going to keep buying Oreos and things like that, but just in this moment we know cookie growth has slightly stalled. Okay, so um, now let's go, uh, let's start talking a little bit about uh, some snack food market trends and really start relating that to, to packaging and their impact on packaging equipment and the space in general. Okay, so on this slide, um, you can see a list of the most frequently mentioned consumer trends during the primary research, during uh, the interview phase. Um, so you've got CPGs here that were the sort of primary uh, group that were interviewed, but we also, we also spoke to a number of OEMs, uh, PMI members, uh, and we're grateful for that, um, who gave us their views on the market and their customers as well. So um, the top four consumer trends in terms of, um, you know, th that are playing a role in terms of packaging, equipment, impact, and are just being noticed in general are the better for you um, snack trend, um, uh, the single serve trend, uh, so lower portions, lesser calories. With a better for you trend, you might have uh, production lines that are entirely dedicated to healthy snacks, and we'll get into that uh, a little bit more later. Um, with re packaging resealability, you want uh, food that remains fresh because you want to take it and move it around. Um, you've got an increasing number of uh, flavors, so you've got flavor variety. You've got growth in combination snacks that can act as meal replacement. You've got growth in size variety. You've got um, an increasing awareness in terms of recyclability and a desire for recyclability. Um, see-through packaging, um, personalization, you know, especially young consumers want their sort of unique personal desires satisfied, um, food safety and guaranteeing food safety, and finally generic packaging. And by generic packaging, we are talking about sort of having simpler packaging with sort of clear ingredient labels, the top three or four key ingredients, not really having like hydrogenated oils and that kind of thing. So um, those are the key consumer trends that were mentioned during the interview process. And on the next slide, we can see uh, a list of the key retail trends that were mentioned um, as being important. So the, the top trend here is shelf-ready packaging. We're going to get to that a little bit later as well, but um, a quick synopsis. I mean, it's a, you, probably you guys all know about this, but it's secondary packaging that is ready to be displayed on the shelf as is. So without unpacking the individual snacks one by one, there are clear benefits, and we'll talk about those. Um, there's an increasing uh, desire for uh, stand-up pouches as well. Um, from a retail perspective, it helps with sales and marketing. You can print cool stuff on stand-up pouches, essentially. Um, there's an increasing desire for lower case counts. Um, for smaller, for easier to open cases and smaller cases, 
those last three that I just mentioned really help with inventory management and streamlining, um, uh, you know, unpacking costs and reducing them. Finally, we talked about having smaller primary packages to really exploit the single serve trend from a consumer perspective and then having more and more products available to entice more consumers to look at the shelves. Okay, so on this next slide, <coughs> let's go into a little bit more detail uh, with respect to the better for you and single serve trends. So the global healthy snacks market uh, was worth about $20 billion in 2016. We're going to get a rate of about 5%, so uh, there's some good growth there. Um, the goal today is to label ingredients simply and clearly on the package, as I mentioned before, having maybe the top two or three ingredients mentioned. Um, people like to know what's in their food more and more uh, and want to be aware from a health perspective. Um, so young consumers, as I've already mentioned, really are, are, are driving um, some of these trends, the better for you in single serve trends. They're more and more health conscious. Um, they're aware of what they're eating, uh, and also they want a lot of their sort of unique desires satisfied, as I've already mentioned. Um, and finally, from a combination snack perspective, a lot of these combo snacks are really including a healthy component and are serving as meal replacement alternatives. Um, so what does this mean um, from a packaging perspective? So uh, growth uh, in better for you snacks implies a potential investment in machinery for bars, so flow wrappers, for nuts and healthy chips, so pouch fillers, including form fill seal machinery, and also SRP, so shelf-ready packaging based case packers, right? And then for combination snacks, you're going to need a lot of tray fillers there. So um, we really expect growth uh, in investment in those types of machines. And so with continued innovation, um, OEMs can continue to meet the needs of C the uh, CPG space and the market in general. And what, and what does the single serve trend mean from a packaging perspective? You'll need faster primary packaging equipment to be able to keep the rate of production at least the same. Typically, you reduce packages, you re but uh, that, would, that typically reduces your overall production rate. So you want to increase uh, the, the speed of these, pack of these primary packaging machines to be able to keep things at least the same. Okay, so on this next slide, let's talk a little bit about kind of this explosion in number of product options, this explosion in SKUs that's been driven by a number of trends. So first of all, and I've kind of mentioned this a couple of times now, there's uh, millennials today, or sort of young consumers, quote unquote, have a uh, really wide variety of needs. They're at, you know, everyone wants kind of their own needs satisfied. Um, and it's different to how f families traditionally purchase their snacks. So um, that means that there needs to be more product options out there in terms of the actual food, more packaging options, that kind of thing. Um, the growth in single serve as well. So what does that mean? You've got traditional larger size options that, are, uh, that have remained available on the market, and you also have now single serve options, so smaller packages um, with lower portions that are available as well. Um, you have also an increase in the number of flavors that are available. Um, and, you know, again, uh, tying into what we're talking about in terms of satisfying unique desires. And finally, the better for you trend uh, has, is playing a role here. You've got your traditional options that are still available, and you now have a lot of healthy options for the different sub-segments that are also available. So what does this mean from a packaging perspective? You have a huge number of SKUs today and an increasing number of product options. You need to have machinery that is flexible enough to be able to run the different types of packages, to be able to run the different types of sizes, uh, to be able to, uh, to, to you know, execute changeovers very efficiently. Um, and so that's the impact kind of on, on packaging machinery and flexibility from the growth in the number of SKUs. Okay, so on this next slide, let's talk a little bit about flexible packaging, which is, you know, obviously very interesting in many different spaces, including in the food and beverage and the snack food space. Um, so overall, some, some market specifics here. So globally, the flexible packaging market was worth about $100 billion in 2016, uh, experiencing some decent growth as well over the, uh, currently and over the next few years. Um, the, the, on the U.S. side, the U.S. had about 25% of the global market in 2016. The key point here really is that while the global rigid packaging market remains larger, the global flexible packaging market is growing much faster. And what's that growth been driven by? Um, you know, the appearance of un and demand for unique types of stand-up pouches. You've got quad packs, you've got doy packs, you've got a number of them that are playing a role, and CPGs are paying attention to that. So you need machinery that, are, that is adapted to these different types of unique packages. Um, the benefits of flexible packaging is probably self-explanatory to most of you guys. You know, they're better suited for printing, so that's a great marketing tool. Um, they take up less space on average than similar uh, rigid packages. 
And then, of course, the multi-layer films allow for food preservation and longer shelf life. Um, so uh, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of demand as well for resealable, flexible packages. Um, uh, you know, that continues to help with um, food preservation. You eat a little bit now, you take your snack somewhere else, and you can still eat it while fresh as well. So that's going to continue to drive growth in zippered stand-up pouches. Um, and from a packaging uh, equipment perspective, that's going to mean growth, more growth in form fill seal machinery, which we're going to talk about a bit more later as well. Okay, so now let's get into uh, e-commerce um, and kind of talk a little bit about its impact on packaging. So um, let's first define e-commerce. Um, so e-commerce is essentially all snacks that are sold online. So your, your typical online retailers, the likes of Amazon, um, play a huge role here, but you also have your traditional retailers like Walmart uh, and Kroger that have online options. And, uh, and so the key here is that these are snacks that are sold online that are delivered to your home. You don't have to move and go anywhere. Um, so if you look at the table, there are some market specifics that are associated with some uh, specific sub-segments here. Um, the key point to show is that you, know, you, you still have some you know, relatively low sales numbers um, and revenue generated uh, you know, by the e-commerce portion um, of sales in these different sub-segments, but the e-commerce segment is growing at, at really large rates, 10, 20, 30 percent in the different sub-segments, and so it's going to continue to play a huge role, uh, and it's going to grow in terms of its impact over the next few years. So what does that mean from a packaging perspective? First of all, its impact on packaging has been confirmed throughout the primary research phase by a number of CPGs. Um, and so uh, we know, for example, we, uh, that uh, certain CPGs are in negotiations with the retailers regarding producing lower case counts that are specifically geared for e-commerce. You want packaging that is uh, called online ready, that is ready to be shipped uh, as is, and that minimizes the repacking effort. So having smaller cases, lower case counts, easier to open cases, ideally, if you can produce cases or if you can produce packages that are just ready to be shipped as is without having any unpacking and repacking done, that's the ideal. But um, the approach there is going to be via the smaller cases and the lower case counts and that kind of thing. So that's the impact that e-commerce is having on the packaging equipment side right now. Uh, and uh, you know, OEMs are going to continue to have to pay attention to that. Okay, so on this next slide right here, um, we already touched upon SRP a little bit, and now let's talk a uh, about it in a little bit more detail. So um, the shelf-ready packaging trend is one that is being driven by Walmart and Kroger, and, a lot, and typically, especially Walmart, a uh, big leader in terms of influencing other retailers uh, to catch on to certain trends. Um, so what is shelf-ready packaging? Again, secondary packaging that is ready to be displayed as is on the shelf. You're not unpacking the individual snacks one by one. You're just removing essentially the top of the case. Uh, and now you've got uh, a display and you've got your primary packs that are ready, ready to be pulled from the shelf. So what are the benefits? It reduces unpacking costs, so that's clear. Um, the, there are certain uh, marketing and brand promotion benefits as well. You can display cool graphics and just cool messages essentially uh, on the cases themselves. Um, from a packaging equipment perspective, what does that mean? There are many different types of shelf-ready packaging. So that puts significant pressure uh, on secondary packaging flexibility. Your case packers and your secondary packaging equipment must be flexible enough to run the different types of uh, SRP-based cases, and they must be flexible enough to reduce um, downtime while running the different cases, um, that kind of thing. Other important retail trends that we mentioned, lower case counts, easier to open cases, smaller cases, all that, all that helps reduce inventory management costs as well. And finally, just to end this section on market trends, let's talk a little bit about kind of the theme of sustainability. And we'll split that into two sort of segments. Material usage um, uh, and then sustainable packaging, so sort of recyclability. So uh, on the material usage side, um, the growth of the single serve and the lower case count trends means that unit material costs increase. So the, the material costs that are associated with producing one snack unit essentially increase as you reduce the size of these packages. Um, so th th that means that uh, a lot of CPGs are going to be focused on trying to reduce material costs there. Um, the increase in the number of product options, the skew explosion, means you have more changeovers, more downtime. So reducing material usage is one way of reducing overall inefficiencies as well. 
and helping mitigate the impact of having more changeovers. Um, and finally, uh, reducing material usage helps achieve certain sustainability goals. You can use that from a marketing perspective. So we've talked to a number of CPGs, and a few of them have told us really that um, one of their top priorities is uh, to focus on finding ways to wrap primary and secondary packaging more tightly around contents. That's something that's already really being done in Europe and Asia, and they want to see more of this uh, in, in North America as well. So there's a belief that there's going to be, need to be innovation in primary and secondary packaging equipment to make this happen. And, and I, I know that's a general statement, but um, what's been mentioned was um, there may be a need to integrate primary and secondary packaging uh, proce uh, processes um, in order to allow for this uh, optimal usage of, of material. And so we'll touch upon that later as well. So from a sustainable packaging side, um, so while consumers, uh, what we found is while consumers are, of course, more aware of um, sustainability issues and um, there's a greater desire for recyclability overall, lack of packaging sustainability is not currently an obstacle to purchase for consumers. And it's not likely to be over the next two to three years. This is a more long-term thing. Um, and so that all, all the better uh, for OEMs and CPGs right now because um, CPGs uh, have tried running different packages that contain post-consumer materials or recycled material and have had trouble doing so. So there needs to be an uh, improvement in sort of material to packaging equipment compatibility. Um, so not just on the packaging equipment side, but on the material side as well, to be able to, to uh, you know, uh, include recycled materials more efficiently in packaging processes. And so um, one last point here is, is so sustainable materials and recyclability has been de uh, described as more of a customer-driven uh, phenomenon than a consumer-driven phenomenon. It's retailers that are trying to get ahead and thinking about, well, when are consumers really going to start caring about this, uh, rather than consumers actually um, uh, you know, requiring this right now and demanding it uh, as a requirement for purchase. So over the next two to three years, not a huge obstacle, but will be important in the long term. And so it's important to pay attention to this, but only in the long term. Okay, so, so just going to pass, pass it back to David right now to talk a little bit more about industry trends and challenges. Thank you, Andrew. So in this next section, uh, we'll discuss the main trends and challenges that are witnessed and faced by the snack food industry. And I will start with a few words about the latest regulatory uh, developments before talking about the importance of contract manufacturing and then highlighting the use of robotics and other industry trends. So the main regulations that uh, were discussed during our uh, investigation were uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act, which is the latest law addressing food safety and thus impacting uh, the snack food manufacturers. But we also talked about the USDA standards. Uh, they have been mentioned by the CPGs who handle meat and cheese mostly, uh, who say that those standards are even stricter than uh, the FSMA standards. Uh, that, that is why combo snacks, for example, are usually developed by meat and cheese companies like Oscar Mayer, Sargento, rather than traditional uh, snack food companies, which are not used to dealing with the uh, stricter USDA standards. So the main drivers behind those uh, the stricter and more complex regulations are clearly food safety and product tracking. And it's not only the regulator uh, that pushes for more complex regulation, but even food companies themselves, uh, they get aware of this and they want to avoid the costly product recalls that would be triggered by food contamination. So what it means in terms of CPG operations then first, there is a need for more stringent documentation and reporting. Uh, there are some new labeling requirements, especially for tracking of goods and ingredients across the value chain down to the consumer. And mostly there are increased efforts to ensure cleanliness of the processing and packaging line. Uh, on the packaging side, on, on the packaging side, sorry, this is obviously true for primary packaging equipment. Uh, but also to some extent to secondary packaging equipment. Uh, it's not only been uh, the CPGs, uh, but also the OEM leaders who have unanimously emphasized the importance of food safety. Even interviewees that were not necessarily aware of the impact of 
uh, FSMA, they all reinforce the need for improved sanitary design for the processing and packaging equipment. So what does it mean uh, in terms of impact for that equipment? Uh, first, there is, there is a need, as I said, for improved sanitary design, uh, mainly processing, but also primary packaging. Uh, the objective is really clear here. CPGs want equipment that they can clean more effectively in less time. They would like to go as far as wishing for an equipment that could be completely washed up. Uh, about a third of the technical interviewees we talked to mentioned the importance of uh, the sanitary design uh, when they, they choose their equipment. There is also an increased need for metal and foreign object detection equipment, and that also includes X-ray machinery. CPGs have mentioned to us the need to install a greater number of detectors throughout the processing and packaging lines, as earlier detection can save in metal scrapping cost in downtime. Uh, the sooner the detection occurs, the greater the saving. And this is an important benefit for the CPGs who look to save as much as they can on their operation front in order to mitigate increased expenditures on raw materials and logistic costs. So the main conclusion uh, of this regulation outlook is that we see more investment coming in the next two to three years towards uh, especially uh, metal detectors, magnetic separators. Uh, X-ray machinery uh, will fit also here in those investments uh, as they can flag defective, defective packages after they have been sealed, but this is a technology that is typically more expensive. So the next big trend uh, we've noticed in the snack food industry is an increased uh, reliance on contract manufacturing, not only from the large one, from smaller companies, especially the newcomers to the snack food market, but also the large brand owners. Uh, it's been confirmed to us in, a, in our talks with OEMs who have acknowledged uh, greater sales, uh, sometimes two to three times more sales coming from co-packers than brand owners. Um, the co-packers need uh, more equipment to produce a wider variety of snacks. Uh, they also have a lower overhead or marketing cost, so they can focus more on spending on equipment. Uh, that increased reliance on contract manufacturing has also been uh, acknowledged by brand owners, even the large one. Uh, the competition globally is, uh, is increasing in the snack food industry. Uh, there are newcomers coming especially to invest in the better for you uh, market. So even the large brand owners nowadays, they, they feel the heat of that competition coming from smaller companies. So uh, this is a reason why they outsource some of their production uh, in order to help, to be helped uh, with their production needs. They also mentioned the rise of uh, installing and operating new production line as a reason uh, for outsourcing their uh, packaging operations. And that also allows brand owner to focus on the marketing aspects rather than the, uh, the operation and the packaging aspects. So the main conclusion here for us is that sanitary design of equipment is going to be key for contract manufacturers. Contract manufacturers want easy equipment that is easier and faster to be cleaned. Um, they have uh, cleaning costs that increase as they deal with a greater variety of products with smaller uh, batches of snack fruits also, and they face uh, two auditing, uh, not only from the regulator, the FSMA-based auditing, but also from their own customers, the brand owners. So that's more, that's more reasons for why sanitary design is key for uh, contract manufacturers. So then, uh, let's have a talk about uh, the use of robotics in the snack food industry. Um, all companies across the board, uh, all CPGs, small, large, have acknowledged uh, that ro the use of robots, the greater use of robots could help them satisfy their throughput goals, especially in primary and secondary packaging application. For example, on the primary side, uh, robots could specifically improve pick and place filling capability for uh, sticky items like bars, for example, but also for uh, tray based uh, snacks like the combo, uh, the combination snacks. On the, 
secondary uh, side, uh, robots could help improve uh, higher precision case loading, especially for uh, shelf-ready packaging applications, as Andrew explained before. I mean, with shelf-ready packaging being uh, more and more demanded by uh, large retailers. That being said, um, the CPGs we've talked to, even the largest one, uh, they still see robotic technology as an expensive technology even today. Uh, they have told us in some cases they fall back on hand packing operations when it's necessary. Um, so we definitely see a need here from the OEMs to uh, educate their CPG customers about the value and the affordability of, of robots. But for those reasons, uh, we don't actually see many CPGs investing in robotics heavily in the next two to three years. Uh, it's more likely to happen further down the road in five uh, or ten years from now. So some of the challenges that have been uh, mentioned during our investigations uh, is the use of sustainable packaging, as Andrew described before. Some CPGs have tasted uh, lightweight packaging or recycled materials and have had issues achieving top speeds with their machines. Uh, so there is a need here for improvements, not necessarily only on the equipment side, but also on the material side. Uh, on a technology standpoint, uh, CPGs have mentioned the difficulty of managing all the data they have access to now. With more and more equipment being connected to computers, being automated, CPGs have access to a greater amount of data than they used to be, and they still see some difficulties to, uh, to manage, sort out all that data, and use it efficiently. So they would like to see more, uh, they would like to see improvements being done here in the way they can extract and analyze all that data. Uh, finally, on the supply chain uh, aspect, there are concerns growing, especially with the rising cost of transportation. So that's another reason that uh, we mentioned before that uh, puts even more pressure on machine efficiencies in order to balance those uh, increased costs. So I will now let Andrew uh, talk about uh, the main unmet needs of CPGs today in the snack food market and how that affects um, the packaging and the processing equipment. Yeah, okay, so thank you, thank you, David, for that. So as David said, let's uh, start talking a little bit about kind of unmet needs and the impact on packaging there. Uh, how many on, on the part of CPGs, I should say. Okay, so on this side, uh, on this slide, uh, you can see a list of the most frequently mentioned unmet needs during the interview process when it comes to packaging equipment. Um, so uh, machine flexibility, we've kind of touched upon that. Uh, and why it's important uh, really is the top uh, priority. Uh, the need for faster packaging machines, um, which is especially relevant when we talk about smaller package sizes, and we'll talk about that. Ease of cleaning and sort of sanitary design. Food safety, you know, having uh, higher quality and more detection equipment uh, uh, per line, per lines, as David touched upon. Overall equipment effectiveness, so ease of maintenance, um, ease of operation, having more flexible vertical form for seal machines. Um, reducing lead times when purchasing um, uh, machines and replacement parts and that kind of thing, and also reducing machine footprint. So um, those are key unmet needs that are mentioned during the process, and let's go uh, into a little bit more detail um, on some of these right now. Okay, so on this slide, um, let's talk a little bit about kind of the really top two unmet needs, um, machine flexibility and uh, machine speeds. Um, so We've talked you know, quite a bit throughout the presentation now about uh, how there's been an increasing number in product options uh, on the shelf and that are available on the market today. There's a greater number of, pro of uh, package formats, a greater number of package sizes, um, and so machines must be able to run different types of primary packs, different types of secondary packages, um, and they must be able to do so efficiently. Changeovers must be efficient as well. Um, on the secondary packaging side specifically, we've already mentioned this, but um, with SRP, uh, shop-ready packaging, there's many different types of SRP-based cases. So that means that uh, there's huge pressure on case packers and uh, other types of secondary packaging equipment to be flexible enough to run the different types of cases. Um, and so this, I mean, we've heard from a number of CPGs that it's a top investment criterion. 
uh, at their companies when it comes to the next wave of packaging machines that, are, that they're going to purchase. Um, so uh, OEMs uh, would do well to heed uh, this advice uh, in their view, in our view, uh, and going forward over the next few years. Um, so in terms of machine speeds, having smaller primary packages, as we mentioned, means you need faster primary packages to maintain the rate of production. Similar with secondary packages as well with the cases. Um, people want smaller and smaller cases. E-commerce is playing a role there as well um, because that's easier to unpack and just easier to store as well from an inventory management perspective. And that means that your case factors are going to need to uh, be able to run uh, a greater number of packages per unit time to maintain the rate of production uh, as well, if not to improve it. Um, so also having product diversification as well, having a greater number of product options available means um, you're looking for uh, efficiency gains in any way you can find. And, Increasing machine speeds is one way to help reduce some of these inefficiencies there. And finally, increasing competitions. Uh, there's increasing competition in the marketplace in general. You have um, many more smaller players that are appearing on the marketplace. You've got co-packers. You've got all kinds of companies that are producing snacks. And so if you can increase packaging speeds, it helps from a competitive perspective and reducing costs overall. Um, Okay, so on this next slide right here, let's talk a little bit more about kind of sanitary design and the ease of cleaning uh, and touch upon food safety. I know David already spoke about that, but if we speak about sanitary design, um, that's mainly relevant obviously for processing equipment and primary packaging equipment, um, like form of sim machinery, other pouch fillers, um, other types of equipment there. Um, the goal really is uh, the ability for machines to be completely washed down, so without damaging electrical equipment, for example, and uh, reducing areas where the food can build up can pool. Um, so the OPEX Leadership Network, another point here, the OPEX Leadership Network has developed clean and place guidelines that I'm sure a lot of you will have heard of. Um, they are relevant in terms of uh, really uh, uh, you know, providing guidance on how to clean interior surfaces of machines without disassembly. So they'll help CPGs wash down as well. Um, talking about food safety, David already mentioned this, but um, you know, the more and more CPGs are going to be investing in more and more metal detectors and installing them throughout packaging lines and not just at the end of them. So packaging and processing lines. Because what that does is you can help, um, you know, you can reduce the cost of recalls, you can catch contaminants earlier, um, and also reduce some of your, your, your uh, scrap uh, material costs. Um, so if you catch, for example, a contaminant later in the process, you might have already sealed your snack so you'll have to scrap more packaging material there. Um, what it does as well, it'll guarantee food safety, and this can be used from a marketing perspective as well to entice consumers. And so those are two key trends that were also mentioned. David touched upon them, but very important for OEMs to keep paying attention to those. Um, and from an investment perspective, metal detectors, ma magnetic separators, um, machinery that can be completely washed down, all that's going to be very important. Um, okay, so on this next slide, um, so mentioned uh, ease of maintenance, uh, you know, it's all about reducing um, maintenance costs, so referred to as well as overall equipment effectiveness. Um, people want, uh, you know, uh, uh, CPGs want uh, machines that can run for many shifts, um, uh, you know, more and more shifts without needing to, to be sort of maintained and dealt with. Um, they want less moving parts per machine if possible. I know that all that's easier said than done, obviously, but they continue to mention these things as being important. Can we reduce um, the amount of effort and time and money that we, we spend and, um, and we uh, allocate to maintenance? Um, ease of operation. So these days you've got big turnover in, in uh, operators and the workforce when it comes to manufacturing, and um, especially for you know, uh, you know, large-scale manufacturing. Um, so you want equipment that is easier to operate, so you spend less time training, training these operators if possible, maybe less HMIs per machines, easier to use HMIs, um, uh, and so just overall, can ease of operation continue to be achieved? I'm sure it is for a lot of equipment. I'm sure it can, there's, it's you know, not perfect for other equipment. Can it be improved? And finally, overall machine footprint. Um, I mean, uh, machines like certain cartoners and horizontal form fill seal machines, which we're going to talk about on the next slide, take up a lot of space. So, for example, on the FFS side, if you have vertical form fill seal machines, they reduce, um, that reduces the footprint. You can have redundant machines. It's a big selling point for the CPGs. Uh, but we're going to talk about the issues with regards to form fill seal machine uh, machinery uh, and why it's important to continue innovating there right on the next slide, which leads me to, there we go. So, um, on, so 
On this slide, we have a selection of essentially of pros and cons that were mentioned by sort of CPG experts when it comes to the use of um, horizontal uh, and vertical uh, forms of steel machinery. So, uh, the big benefit with vertical FFS, as I just mentioned, is that uh, there's a much lower space allocation. They take up less space than horizontal forms of steel machines. That allows for redundant machinery. So, they can also run pillow shaped pouches uh, efficiently enough. But the big problem with vertical FFS is that they can't run zippered or unzippered stand-up pouches as well and as efficiently as horizontal form for steel machinery. At least the majority of them can't today. Um, there's certain wraparound issues that we've heard mentioned by CPGs in terms of materials uh, wrapping, some of the zippers um, wrapping and causing downtime. They also can't run pre-made pouches. Um, uh, they can't run that at all. They, they, they need roll stocks. Whereas horizontal form of steel machinery, while they take up a lot of space and generate a lot of waste, they can run stand-up pouches efficiently, they can run pre-made pouches, and they're just, it's just a more flexible machine in general. So CPGs are looking for cheaper, uh, of course cheaper, but really more flexible vertical form of steel machines that can really run stand-up pouches efficiently enough, uh, including the zippered kind of stand-up pouches. Okay, so uh, just to conclude uh, the, the, uh, the portion, the segment on unmet needs, um, a lot of CPGs have talked about innovation. I know that's a general concept, but uh, we've heard a few examples of how they believe um, there can be more innovation uh, in, in, in packaging equipment. So there's a general belief that in innovation has been too incremental over the last 10 years in packaging equipment. Um, you know, an example would be, for example, you know, if we talk, we, we, we heard an example about a certain type of cartoner, for example. You know, different, there's different cartoning suppliers that might have, um, you know, they might be the best at certain qualities. So, for example, company A might have, uh, the, uh, you know, the best cartoner for quality A. Company B might have the best cartoner for quality B, uh, and so on and so forth. And all these different companies had patents that were associated with these different qualities. Um, and so the belief is that for, you know, for a number of these uh, machines, for example, uh, a number of these qualities, a lot of the patents uh, have expired today, but there hasn't been enough effort, at least that's the feeling from CPGs, the perception there, uh, not enough effort uh, to kind of combine the different innovations and make sort of, uh, you know, a radically improved machine um, for different types of uh, packaging equipment. Um, now, of course, all kinds of, uh, you know, in general, in any industry, customers are going to say that we want, you know, cheaper machines, better machines, more innovation. But that's something that we heard um, a few times mentioned during the primary research. Um, another thing that we've already touched upon, um, the optimization of packaging usage. There's a long-term goal, which is to tighten and to wrap primary and secondary packages around contents more tightly. Um, so that will really help uh, reduce material usage and material costs. And there's a belief that uh, there might need to be an integration of primary uh, and secondary packaging processes to make this happen. For technical details there, um, I mean, it's really not clear, but um, again, the word integration was used a few times uh, uh, to kind of talk about how maybe primary and secondary processes can innovate to be able to uh, achieve material reduction goals. Um, and finally, in terms of robotics, David already mentioned that really there's a perception that a lot of robotically equipped technology is, um, is, is expensive. Um, that's probably true for some types of, uh, of uh, machines, maybe not so true for others. There needs to be greater education, as David said, in terms of um, the market being aware of affordable options. But, yeah, you know, uh, continued R&D investment uh, from a robotics perspective is important over the next few years because uh, more and more down the line in the next five to ten years, there's going to be much bigger investment uh, in robotically equipped technology. In the next two to three years, there might be some investment in some types of robotically equipped machines, but uh, overall, really, it's more important in the long term, in the next five to ten years. Okay, so... Uh, so that was kind of a summary of the unmet needs portion of the presentation. Uh, I'll leave it to David to, to conclude, and I'll touch upon with a couple of points in there as well. Okay. Thank you, Andrew. So let's wrap up this presentation by highlighting the, the key findings of our investigation. And we'll start with the main trends in the snack food industry. Uh, if we look at market trends, uh, better for you will continue to play a key role going forward. Uh, it's forecasted to keep Every snack, investing in that uh, better for you trend is expected to uh, keep growing uh, fast. Uh, same can be said for combination snacks, uh, which are also likely to continue along a fast uh, growth trajectory. 
on packaging trends. Uh, we see flexible packaging still growing. There is still room here for flexible packaging replacing rigid or, or traditional packaging types. Uh, there will be a focus on shelf-ready packaging. Uh, retailer, but especially the large ones, uh, wants to streamline their business, so that helps them a lot here. Uh, as for packaging sustainability, as we said, uh, probably not very important for the next two to three years, at least not a blocking point for the consumer, uh, but it's a long-term goal of uh, CPGs. On the retail side, uh, the number of SKUs uh, will continue to grow, and that's going to be driven by the growth of e-commerce, uh, the increased demand for more flavor variety, as well as, more, uh, as, a, as, well as a greater size variety uh, across all types of uh, snack foods. Uh, yes, so just to summarize some of the, the main demands from CPGs, we've already mentioned all this stuff, but just a quick summary. Um, so the top demands really for greater flexibility and increased speed of packaging machinery, especially secondary packaging sign, and that's driven really by the SRP trend. Um, a need for improved sanitary design, driven by the Food Safety Modernization Act, general food safety goals, um, and finally, CPGs really wish to see more disruptive innovation rather than incremental uh, improvements. Other demands that are mentioned, ease of maintenance, ease of operation, reducing lead times, um, machine footprint reduction, and also dealing with the perception that robotically equipped technology is too expensive. And finally, uh, the key takeaways about where we see investments in machinery going uh, in the next two to three years. So the top three uh, areas where we see more investment uh, uh, towards more flexible and faster secondary packaging equipment. Uh, we also see uh, a greater demand for vertical form fill seal machinery, especially if those vertical uh, FFS machinery uh, catch up with the horizontal uh, counterparts in the areas where they are still uh, behind. And we do see also increased investment in metal detection equipment, especially to uh, uh, guarantee food safety. Other areas uh, that could drive uh, investment in equipment are more flexible and faster pouch filling machinery. Uh, all equipment that would be associated with fast growing segments. Uh, we do see CPGs also purchasing a dedicated line for better for you products like for example gluten free or allergen free products. And finally, uh, the increased reliance on copacos mean that uh, OEMs will keep seeing more orders coming from copacos and brand owners in the next few years. So uh, we'd like to thank you all for listening to us during that webinar. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we do our best to uh, answer them as, as much as we can uh, in the next few minutes. Absolutely, and thanks for listening to us, guys. David and Andrew, thank you both. It's a great presentation. There's a lot of information here in this webinar, but there's also a lot more information in the report, which you can download on pmmi.org slash research and search for snack foods. So I want to thank you on the great reflections you had about the issues in hand in the snack foods packaging and processing industry. Um, again, please put some questions that you might like to see answered in the participant feedback box on the left-hand corner. I do have a couple questions, so I'm going to read them off to you. So the first question is, is the demand for co-packing linked with any specific type of packaging format, um, such as like our pouches, the format requested more to co-packers than others? Right, so um, I would say that not necessarily. And I'll tell you why I'm not saying a yes or a no here. It's not necessarily because you'll find a lot of, um, you'll still find, so for example, if we look at nuts and seeds, you'll find a lot of um, contract manufactured uh, snacks that are like in cups, the rigid cups. Um, and so there's a lot of demand for those as well. Those will go, for example, in a lot of 7-Eleven and convenience stores. You'll have a lot of those actually in retail stores as well. So, um, so it's not, and it's not something we heard specifically throughout the primary research phase, but we do know that there's significant growth in, the, in, the, in flexible packaging in snack foods and there's greater growth on the flexible side than the rigid side. That's something that we know for sure. So uh, th there's, there's going to be definite impact on contract manufacturing operations. We do expect them to be dealing with more flexible packages 
it's not something that we heard of specifically, that they're only doing the flexible because the rigid types of packages, like the ones I just mentioned for nuts and seeds, are going to continue to be important. Okay, so that kind of lead, led right into the next question. Um, somebody was questioning about shelf-ready packaging. Is, do you see that trend mainly for flexible, or is, is it, there, you said they're still rigid, so you think that's still going to be the thing where flexible is definitely increasing, but rigid hasn't lost its hold? Yeah, so, 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 so that's part of it. That's definitely a part of it, but there's something specific as well with the SRP. What I would say is that so um, the, the start of this trend was really associated with um, nuts and seeds uh, and, and certain types of snacks there, and, and, uh, but, but uh, nuts and seeds that were packaged uh, with flexible packaging. Um, because so um, some of the benefits that we spoke about earlier, some of the benefits of flexible packaging, they, they take up less space, right? And they're also great for printing. So with the SRP, you can have great graphics as well on, uh, you know, on the sides of the case. But you can also, with flexible packaging, you can, you can have tall packages that don't take up so much space, and you can fit a lot more of them, uh, you know, within the, you know, certain SRP type cases. So um, it, it's, it's definitely going to be geared more towards flexible packaging. Started with nuts and seeds. There are certain brands that are very relevant, I think. Uh, so uh, an example of a type, I mean, I was walking by Kroger and, uh, the other day, and David Seeds, uh, you know, it's a type of, it's a famous type of snack, I'm sure, and like, uh, you know, that's a type of, an example of a type of product that, you know, was really important, I think, at the start of the SRP trend as well. And they're flexible, see, they're flexible packages, you fit a lot of them in the SRP cases, and it's really going to be geared more towards flexible packaging. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew and David. So another question we have, um, from your perspective and your experience in working and conducting this report, do you think these North America trends and consequences will also apply to other regional snack markets? Yes, yeah, so I, I would say um, for a lot of them, yes. So give an example. I mean, for, for so you know how we mentioned um, the importance of reducing material usage. I kind of I, I already I mentioned Europe and Asia kind of as already being two regional markets where um, the view from CPGs here is that. Uh, you know, a lot of the snacks there are, uh, the, you know, this concept of wrapping primary packs and secondary packages more tightly around, around uh, the contents and kind of optimizing packaging usage. That's something that CPG's view is already being, you know, widely done in Europe and Asia and not so much here. So that's a difference in terms of something that's done that, that CPGs would like more, um, would like to see more uh, in North America. In terms of flexible packaging, I would say that a lot of the trends with flexible packaging are worldwide, but what I would say is for shelf-ready packaging, for example, that's really a North America trend, right? Shelf-ready packaging is a big North America thing. Probably in the long term, it's going to be important uh, elsewhere as well, but um, when it comes to marketing and brand promotion and just the, you know, uh, the likes of Walmart re really leading the way and innovating from a retail perspective in terms of enticing consumers, that's really an example of something that's really relevant um, for North America. In terms of other important uh, trends that we mentioned, I mean sustainability, for example, I think with recyclability, that, that's an example of a trend that's more important in Europe than it is in North America right now. Um, so there's, I, I think, for example, I can't remember what countries, but um, there are certain laws when it comes to packaging waste. Uh, you pay by the pound, I think, or by the kilogram, you know, for, for, for in terms of mass of, of uh, waste. Uh, in certain countries in Europe, uh, and so the idea is how can we reduce our waste? Well, reduce the weight of your materials, first of all, but also recycle uh, more of your products, too. So I think it's more, that's more important in Europe. Um, a lot of other trends, I think, are similar overall, but I hope that gives a, a good you know, first perspective on some of the differences and similarities between Europe, Asia, and, the, and North America. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that explanation, Andrew. Absolutely. So right at this point, that is the conclusion of our webinar, and I would like to, on behalf of PMMI, thank you for participating in today's webinar. As a final note, you will receive an email to complete um, an evaluation for today's webinar. Let us know how we did, let us know how the topic went, and let us know if there's any topic that you'd like to see us do a report or a webinar on in the future. As I mentioned in the participant feedback box, 
This webinar will be posted on PMMI.org slash research in probably 24 to 48 hours. And we also have a webinar coming up on July 12th. It'll be our third quarter quarterly economic outlook report. So you should be getting an email on that or a notice for that shortly. So please sign up for that webinar. Um, our economists are some of the funniest ones I've ever seen. And if you think you can talk about the economy and be funny and you've never heard that, you have to tune into our webinar and listen to it. It's great. So once again, on behalf of Pim and Mai, thank you so much for joining us today. Andrew and David, great presentation. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Paula. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, Thanks everyone. everyone.